what's up guys don't ask me what that cheesy countdown was for <laughs> I said it's, it's an option on Streamyard, so i thought i'd give it a shot and see what it was all about not sure how i feel about that but um we'll let uh some more people join up here it's monday night i'm not expecting too many people but thanks for joining me um we uh have been doing a lot of these live editions of the podcast and i'm really enjoying them and it's clear that i need more practice so this is what we're going to do today we're going to have project car of the week high performance parts listener stories and then i'm just gonna we're just gonna shoot the breeze a little bit i'm going to tell you about what's going on with myself and the mr norm tribute truck and how i almost burned it to the ground i'm sure a lot of you heard the story but uh i did get it fixed so we'll talk about that a little bit. And I did buy a new daily driver. I traded in my old daily driver, which was a 2012 Ram 1500. It was lifted on a 20 inch. It was a mall crawler. I never took the thing off road and it was a 4.7 V8. Okay. So a 1500 lifted with a 4.7 is gutless. <laughs> All right. So I've been dealing with it for several years now and uh it got to the point where i was like you know what i need something a little bit more practical i have a daughter she's two it's really hard to get her up into the truck and i, I just wanted something something new sometimes you need a, a refresh and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit but uh, i did want to mention that i'm going to be at muscle cars at the strip that's in las vegas september 10th and 11th it's going to be an awesome event there's going to be drag racing a car show swap meet vendors and a whole lot of fun um mopars 5150 is going to be giving away some project muscle cars on the 11th so it's going to be a crazy weekend i hope to see you guys there it's going to be at las vegas motor speedway and they're going to be drag racing into the night it's going to be a blast i'm looking forward to it i'm going to get a ton of coverage from the show hopefully i'll be able to go live with some of the cars owners and some of the personalities that we meet there so it's going to be a good time johnny mopar is supposed to join me out there so that's going to be fun and uh, quite a few of my other little mopar friends are going to be over there it's going to be a blast i cannot wait and then the weekend after that i'll be in kentucky i'm heading out to kentucky for mo party the second annual holly's mo party that's in uh bowling green kentucky and it's going to be that's going to be a blast too I, I believe it's at uh beach bend raceway park or something like that but um i'm meeting big block matt monroe and blake from diy hemi out there and you know uh mike from diy hemi is going to be there too and we're just going to have a blast it's going to be fun and a lot of content from there too so it's going to be uh it's going to be a busy end of the summer here as we shut it down um the podcast is still going strong and we are three episodes away from 100 i still haven't decided what i'm going to do for episode 100 yet but hopefully it'll be something special maybe i'll just come on here and see who wants to join me and uh we'll just shoot the breeze and talk mopars i don't know yet it'll be a it'll be a fun little celebration for me and hopefully uh fans of the show and people that have been paying attention to it for you know the past couple years that i've been doing it it's been a lot of fun um but that's what we got on the on the schedule for today and for the summer so without further ado if you are a mopar enthusiast then you are in the right place don't go anywhere you're tuned into the best mopar enthusiast driven podcast on planet earth and i'm your host chris albrecht better known as the mopar hunter and this is talking mopars live You're listening to Talking Mopars with the Mopar Hunter, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Live once again. God, like I said, I really enjoy these. So let's go ahead and get into what I normally do on not live episodes of the podcast. And let's talk about a project car. Now, a lot of you that have been following my Facebook page for a long time have probably noticed over the past couple of weeks that the car postings have slowed down. That's mostly because I want to start I want to start transitioning into more video content and I'm working on the schedule to try to figure out how I'm going to do it. I've got a lot on my plate, so I'm just trying to figure it out. So for right now, if you want to see project cars or a project car every time I go live here, you'll find it on Talking Mopars, um, the Facebook page. And instead of posting the cars and just sharing the links, I'm probably going to do more video stuff. So 
it's just a matter of finding the time and getting it all. Uh, my life has been kind of crazy lately, so that's why this episode is late. I bought a car over the weekend. It, just, it was just a, a tough weekend. I, I actually called into work today. I got up at 3.30 in the morning, and I said, you know what? <laughs> I need a mental health day. I literally took a day off and just hung out with my family and just decompressed. And I'm glad I did because my work truck broke down. What a surprise. <laughs> so I avoided that mess, but I'll be back to work tomorrow. So I thought maybe before I hit the sack for tonight, I will join the live here and um, talk Mopars with you all. So let's get into this project car. Let me share my screen here. I just jumped on Craigslist and I picked something that I thought was um, a reasonable project that, you know, most people could uh, relate to as far as you know, it's not a seventy thousand dollar charger that's been fully restored. This is an afford what I what I consider an affordable muscle car. Um, some might not even consider it a muscle car, but let's take a look at what we got here. So, what we have is a a body, a 1976 Dodge Dart Sport from Nevada, manual trans factory sunroof car for six thousand dollars in Fond du Lac, Fond du Lac. I, I guess. I don't know. People in Wisconsin, tell me how to pronounce that because I don't know. But uh, let's read this ad here. For sale, 1976 Dodge Dart Sport, 318 four-barrel manual transmission. This car has a super cool factory crank-out sunroof, and the sunroof works properly. The car is originally from Nevada, so it's quite solid overall. The frame is very solid and still has original paint overspray on it. The body has minimal rust. It will need a driver's side floor pan. The car runs and drives stops. Starts and stops, but is not roadworthy, a.k.a. it will need to be trailered home. It was recently removed from long-term storage, basically could use a good once-over before regularly driving it. It has a newer dual exhaust system, newer leaf springs, new clutch, new four-barrel carburetor, and more. Has factory rally wheels and respectable tires. The brakes work, etc. It will need a total restoration for show or just go over the basics to make it a make it into a driver starting with a car like this is much better than starting with something that is completely rusted out and been off the road for decades car has a clean title first six thousand firm takes it locate or a local pickup in fond du lac wisconsin and the owner's name is dan if you see the ad then the car is still for sale so apparently this dart sport is still for sale it's got a clean title odometer reads seventy thousand four hundred three miles um Let's take a look at some pictures up close. Now, I picked this because, you know, it's well under 10, it's well under 10 grand, and it seems like, if the picture will load here, there we go, um, it seems like these cars are starting to come up in price again. I mean, I hear all the time about, you know, people getting these cars for free or a couple hundred dollars, and now they're in the thousands of dollars, and they're knocking on the door of 10 grand. I've seen plenty of A-bodies, you know, uh, 70, 71, 72, Dusters and Demons um, go for in the low low teens, 10, 11,000. So, you know, when you get under 10, these are the types of cars you're usually looking at, unless you're looking at complete basket cases. Um, this one, you know, I thought it was cool because it had the factory sunroof. But uh, I always promote A-bodies as being good Mopar projects because they're so versatile and there's still plenty of parts cars out there. And they're still reasonably priced. You can still get them for a decent amount of money. I mean, six grand isn't, nothing, isn't you know, a drop in the bucket for a lot of people anyway. I know I don't have six grand laying around. But um, I do think that if you want to get into the Mopar muscle car game or just the classic car game, A-body Mopars make great project cars. Um, the, parts, the parts aren't as expensive as some of the E-body and B-body stuff that you see. Um, and they're a lot more available than the F, M, and J body stuff. So basically what I see here is uh, yeah, it's a roadkill car, you know? Um, I hate to be cliche and say that, but I mean, look at what we got here. Manual transmission, bucket seats, and you can patch that floor really easy if you just want a ratty, a ratty uh, car to drive around. I mean, this thing is ready to go. You just got to get through it. Uh, the sunroof actually looks in really good condition. Sometimes you see these and the tracks are all rotted out. So it's a blessing that this car is from Nevada. It really uh, did this car a lot of justice. Um, it looks solid for six grand. I mean, even the door panels are, <laughs> are in pretty decent shape. The dash, you know, the dash pads tore up, but you know, it's ratty. What do you expect? But um, yeah, it's funny. Every time I see dart sports, it always cracks me up when I think about 
you know, the religious uh, sect that was having a problem with uh, the name Demon. So they went back to Dart and uh, the Demon died and the Dart Sport lived. I always thought that was kind of funny. Look at the back seat in this thing. Aside from some tears up top, it looks pretty solid. Um, usually you can see uh, mold all over the belts. This looks pretty good. The floor doesn't look too bad on the back seat anyway, but who knows what's underneath that carpet. But um, spare tire well looks good. It's got a rally wheel, full-size spare. Jack is in it. Yeah, that's not too bad at all. This is a, I don't know, here we got a shot underneath. It is solid. I mean, like I said, a desert car. This is, this is a, a really good platform to build a ratty driver. You know, you're not going to be winning any shows with this unless they have a ratty driver class. <laughs> but, um, you know, cars like this don't give, get enough love. You know, everybody wants the Chargers, the Challengers, the Cudas, um, and even the even the Dusters and Demons over a Dart Sport or like a Plymouth Scamp or a Valiant. But those cars, man, you can still get them reasonably cheap and you can still have a lot of fun. I've said this before. You can throw, uh, you know, some of them come with small blocks already. You can build up the little small block and then throw it in something else that you find later on down the road. You can build a big block and do a big block swap in an A body. That's always a lot of fun. And then you can take the big block out if you find another car that you'd rather have it in. So for $6,000, I think this is a really good buy. Um, obviously, you know how we work. We don't pay $6,000. So you want to work with him on the price a little bit. He says 6,000 firm, but something tells me if you walked up to him with 5,500 cash, he's probably not going to say no. You know what I mean? You drive up there with your truck and trailer and you say, Hey, look, I got 5,500. Let's, you know, let's make something happen. He might say yes. Um, and you know what? Even at six grand, this car is pretty solid. I mean, I'm looking at the door jams, the door jams look clean. Um, even the quarters, the pictures that he has of the quarters look pretty good. There's a little, a little something going on on the front there, but I mean, you know, a dent on the side here on the passenger side, but overall, I mean, the car really doesn't even have too much, um, sun damage on the top. I mean, it does, but not like you've seen some where the whole top layer is just burned off because it's been sitting in the sun for so many years. Um, the grill looks clean. The bumper looks clean. It doesn't look like it's been hit. Um, yeah, this is a, this would be a fun, a fun project car for somebody. Um, a lot of people don't like the big bumper style and the tail lights and the big beak on the front end. You know, all that can be changed. You can cut that sucker off, cut that sucker off, and do a front and rear clip swap, you know, and make a clone of something, um, like Duster or Demon. Uh, in this case, it's a Dodge, so you'd probably go with the Demon. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, six grand, come on. You know, it's these cars are not getting any younger and they're not getting easier to find. I'll tell you that. But um, I think cars like this are a good buy and a good um, gateway drug <laughs> into Mopars. So that's Project Car of the Week or of the Day in this case, uh, the 1976 Dodge Dart Sport from Nevada in Wisconsin with a factory sunroof and a manual transmission for $6,000. Very cool car. Let's uh, jump back onto the screen here. Um, we got high performance parts too. Uh, high performance parts, for those that are new to the show, is a segment of the show where you know a lot of people are like, "Oh, high performance parts." He must be talking about you know carburetors or something. High performance parts is just a play on words. It's basically um, me featuring a car or cars from movies, TV shows, music videos, things like that. Anytime you've seen a Mopar specifically on the big screen, I'd like to talk about it, at least mention it. You know, a lot of the history of these cars is hard to find. And some of these cars that I've talked about in the past have been used for several different TV or movie appearances. It's crazy how that works. But some of them get around. Um, <laughs> the other... Oh, gosh, I guess it would be a month now. Time is really flying. This summer seems like it's flying by. I don't know what you guys think about that, but um, I uh, I was up really late. I mean, it was like two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I just stay up late and I burn the candle and uh, burn that midnight oil. And I was up late and I was just, I don't know if it was Hulu or Netflix. I was flipping through some one of the apps that I have to watch shows and movies and stuff. And I saw Death Proof. It's a Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez film. And uh, it's like B-movie 
craziness. And uh, in Death Proof, Kurt Russell plays this crazy, crazy stunt man, stunt man Mike, and he builds cars that are death proof for him, but not for his passengers. And he knows that whatever crazy stuff he does behind the wheel, he's never going to die. So um, I'm not going to go into the whole movie spiel. If you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, if you like those campy B movie uh flicks but um i actually to make my life a little easier today uh because i knew what i wanted to share for high performance parts i just brought up an article that i could find and i actually when i was looking it up i found an article um that was the 10 best movie mopars of the past 50 years so it just so happened that the death proof cars were in this one um which i thought was cool so let's see here let me just move that over there and bring that up. So Death Proof was made in 2007. The cars that are featured in the movie, I'm sure you can see on the screen there. Um, a 1971 Dodge Challenger, according to this article, it was made to look like a 70 RT. That's the white one there, the Vanishing Point style. And the 1969 Dodge Charger with uh, the Death Proof duck on the front of it. Um, that is uh, the Charger driven by Kurt Russell later on in the film. Um, and the Challenger is driven by these these ladies, these three ladies. Uh, on the hood there, that's Zoe Bell. She's a pretty well-known stunt woman, and she is a badass. <laughs> um, a lot of these stunts, she was really hanging on to this hood at like 70, 80 miles an hour. It's insane. But um, uh, the drivers, Tracy Toms is Kim, so... That would be the lady behind the wheel and Kurt Russell as stuntman Mike Zoe Bell as this character. I forget her name, but uh, the article, it says why it's awesome. And it says setting aside the fact that the Mopar chase sequence in Death Proof is packed with references to scenes from Gone in 60 Seconds, Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, Convoy Bullet and Vanishing Point. Can we just direct your attention to the fact that the nearly 20 minute confrontation between a challenger and charger takes place with stunt woman turned actor Zoe Bell gripping the hood of the former for dear life. Uh, it's one of the most nail-biting sequences ever committed to digital film and a true love letter to the golden age of car chases. It really was a fun movie to watch. If you like car chases, is it the best car chase featuring Mopars in movies? No, I don't think so. But it's really cool. And if you like action, you like Mopars, go check out Death Proof. It's a ridiculous movie, but uh, I didn't start really enjoying it until the Mopars started playing around on screen. So that's high performance parts. The 1970 clone, so 71 made to look like 70, Challenger RT and the 69 Dodge Charger featured in Death Proof. That was high performance parts. Let's jump into the comments real quick. I don't know if anybody's been commenting. I don't have those pulled up. Let me... Uh... Let's get back over here. Two comments. Mark Moore, what up, brother? <laughs> What's up, man? Just hanging out Monday night. Spencer, would love another duster. Just have to finish the charger first. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, if you have a charger, <laughs> I wouldn't even be worried about a duster if I was you. <laughs> it's kind of like Johnny Mopar. He's got all these chargers, and then he's got one duster. Just <laughs> the lone A body in his collection. Um Michael says he wants to seek his 74 Valiant. Uh, do you know the whereabouts of it? Did it just disappear? Did you, did you, clearly you sold it. So um, do you have any of the information, VIN number, anything like that, previous license plate? Um, sometimes those things can help if you go to the Department of Licensing and, um, you know, make a friend, see if they'll look it up for you. Uh, some places don't keep records that old. Um, from what I understand, they all went digital at some point and got rid of all their old documents. So some of the old registrations and stuff have been completely wiped out. That's from what I understand from what I've been told. Um, so it's kind of hard to find those old cars unless you know the person that you sold it to. Maybe you still have the bill of sale or something. Um, yeah, it's really hard to track down cars. Uh, in, the five, in the six years that I was doing the Mopar Hunter and now the podcast, I have talked to so many people that have reached out to me asking me to help them find their uh, their old car and as much as i would love to it is so hard 
unless you have something crazy, you know, you have a wing car or like an A12 or, you know, a Hemi car, 446 pack car, something that really stands out from the crowd and that likely wouldn't have been crushed if it was sold or parted out or anything like that. Those are easier to find, but um, nothing's impossible. You know what I mean? Oh, he doesn't want to seek a 74 Valiant. He wants to sell a 74 Valiant. That's cool, man. Uh, what do you want for it? Give us some details. Or send me the, you can PM me the link, and uh, I'll put it up on the uh, on the Talking Mopars podcast page. Rory Wheeler says, been adding to the hardware with the duster this year. Awesome, dude. I love a bodies, man. I had one. I sold it just because I was, uh, the project was dead in the water and it wasn't, it was not going to get done anytime soon. It was not going to see the road anytime soon. I missed that car, but it's water under the bridge. I love a bodies. A bodies are great. Uh, man, I've seen some a bodies where I was like, you know, a lot of the GTS darts really, really get my engine going. You know, the big block cars, um, the factory big block cars. I've seen a couple where I'm like, I'd rather have that big block dart than, you know, a 68, you know, Charger RT, not because of the monetary value, but because of how crazy it is that they actually made big block A bodies back then. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of controversial, I guess, but I really like GTS darts and I really like Formula S Barracudas. Um, I, w I still, I still have a thing for the 67 through 69 Barry, <laughs> Barry Cudas. Um, the 67 through 69 Barry Cudas. Um, I really love those cars. I've had a chance at a few of them in my life and it never worked out, unfortunately, but they're awesome. I love seeing them at car shows. I love seeing them on the street and I hope to see more in people's yards because <laughs> the ones that I know about, nobody wants to sell. So it's, it's tough. Jason says he's building a 60,000 mile A body. That's awesome. Roy Wheeler says top 40, top 50, first, wow, first at a local. Oh, hey. <laughs> Winning trophies at car shows has always been a dream of mine. I don't have a vehicle that apparently is on par with that yet. Even the Mr. Norm tribute truck. I take that thing to shows and I see some of the other trucks that are there and I'm like, okay, you know. All right. Or some of the other patina vehicles that are there. And uh, there's some stiff competition out there, man. There's a lot of cool stuff. Um, I think I'd have to go to a show that is Mopar specific. And they would have to really be fans of Grand Spalding Dodge and those old tin grills, the 72 to 80 Dodge trucks, um, to ever get an award for mine. But we'll see. I plan on getting some awards once I get everything underneath the truck and under the hood you know, where I want it to be. Um, the body and the paintwork and stuff, that's that's uh, that's going to be left alone. Uh, Jason says, currently building a 60,000 mile numbers matching 68 Charger 383 HP four speed car. That is awesome. <laughs> um, 68 Chargers are my favorite Chargers. Um, that is a an opinion that everybody has a different opinion of which charger they think is the best. Some guys like the first generation chargers, which are cool. I think they're cool in their own right. They deserve respect. Um, I'm a fan of the 68 and I think it has a lot to do with my dad back in the day, probably in the early eighties, mid seventies, somewhere in that time period, he was at a wrecking yard. Um, I'm assuming near Seattle and he saw a 68 Charger and he took the taillights. And all my life, he's had a set of 68 Dodge Charger taillights. And I've always wanted to find a Charger, a 68, that was missing its taillights so that we can throw them in the Charger. And I do know of a 68 Charger RT that does not have taillights. And um, it's actually a car that I've been wanting to do a live video on for the Facebook page, which these live videos I've been doing have been Man, I've been getting a lot of hate. You know, people think that I'm just trespassing on people's property. <laughs> it's really funny. I had to stop reading comments. So if you comment on my posts on the Talking Mopars podcast page, I look at some of them. Some of them I just I just let be. Um, just because I, you know, who has time to read through a bunch of troll stuff, you know? And I appreciate everybody that leaves cool comments and nice comments. It's just, it really is impossible for me to reply to everybody. I wish I could. I wish I had that kind of time. I just don't. And um, 
when I go on there and I see just garbage comments from garbage people, it, it annoys me. So um, just know that if you do post a good comment, um, there's a, we'll say 60% chance I'll see it. Um, and if I see it, I'll like it. Michael says, uh, he's building a 72 duster, just trying to finish up 318 board 30 over. Awesome. Spencer says, also love the tin grill trucks. I had one. Those also make great project uh, Mopars, you know, much like the A bodies. Um, I love them for project cars and the C bodies too. The C bodies don't get enough love. I know I I, I feel like I have been neglecting them on this show and I feel bad for that because I know there's a lot of people that are into C bodies that listen and watch the show and um i love sea bodies every once in a while i'll see one where i'm like god that would be such a cool hot rod you know what i mean some of them have the ability to pull off the muscle car feel you know what i mean and some of them the big body sedans it's a little bit more challenging but you, it can be done i've seen it um Billy says, I know of a 69 Cuda 383 four-speed car. It's a basket case, but the body is very solid. Almost bought it a week ago, but bought a 65B body instead. Billy, how much did the guy want for the big block Cuda? That's uh, that's cool. Oh, <laughs> I posted a video. Um, some of you may or may not have seen it. It's the one where there's a couple Barracudas behind a fence at a storage facility. And I kept saying Cuda in the video when I was referring to the 70. And I got roasted for it and like i do know the difference but i'm so used to saying cuda that i just say cuda so you know sue me if you want i guess <laughs> uh that's the the mopar purist thing and i get it you know it's like when somebody calls in violet for a plymouth when they call it plum crazy i'm not gonna beat them up for it you know the more widely known name is plum crazy so you know i would i correct them if i heard that probably not unless unless they deserve to be humbled out a little bit. You know those people that I'm talking about, the ones that, you know, run their mouth and it's like, okay, I got to humble this guy a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes you run into those people. Sean says, I just bought my first Hemi Charger at 18. I love it so much. I got some questions, Sean. Are we talking about a Hemi Charger, Hemi Charger? Like, you know, anywhere between 66 and 71? <laughs> or are we talking uh, newer, modern Mopar Hemi Challenger or Charger? Because those are cool, too. I have no problems with modern Mopars. In fact, I just bought one over the weekend. We'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, Hemi Charger at 18. Hell yeah, dude. Billy says that the big block Barracuda is $5,500 in Indiana. That is insane. <laughs> um especially if it's really solid is it billy is it all put together does it have all the parts what's it missing sean says no 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 an rt lx platform charger um yeah i wish i wish uh when i was 18 i had something that cool dude i didn't man uh i did not end up with a muscle car my first car was an import it was a little honda civic um I'm not ashamed to say that because I knew in time as I grew up and as I got a job and as I got my feet, you know, planted firmly in the dirt <laughs> that I would be able to afford Mopar someday. Um, I still I still have a little bit of resentment towards my dad because there was a couple there was a 70 duster that I wanted and there was a couple fastback Barracudas. Um, I think one was a 68 and one was a 69. Uh, I wanted I wanted all three of those cars at different times, but each time my dad wouldn't help me pull the trigger and I didn't have a job, you know, it was, you know, I, I appreciate kids that work hard, make the money and go buy their cars. You know, I was in a weird living situation, so it was hard for me to get to work and to save the money. It would have, I would have needed to get any of these crazy cars. You know, when I started working, I was busting tires at a tire store for, I think I started at like just over $7 an hour. <laughs> so, and it was an after school job. So I worked two hours a day and then eight hours on Sunday. So, um, I really couldn't afford anything back then. <laughs> so even, even having a Honda Civic was putting fuel in the tank for that thing was a stretch, but here we are now. Now I have my Mopars and I'm very happy to have had them, but Hey, if you're starting off with a uh, LX platform charger, that's awesome, dude. I love the aftermarket support for the modern Mopars. I think it's great, um, especially with the Hemi stuff. Um, I don't think that in in this in this spectrum here, 
you know, with talking Mopars and the Mopar Hunter or what it was before we transitioned to completely uh, talking Mopars podcast. Um, I don't think I've shown a l enough love to the modern Mopars, and that's my bad. I do love the modern Mopars. I've, this, I've always been critical of the stock cars that I see at car shows and stuff. And, hey, you know, it's it's really not a knock. You know, if you're proud of your car, show it. You know, it's just my personal opinion that I wouldn't want to take a stock car to a sh car show because I feel like, you know, I could just go to a dealership and see <laughs> stock chargers and challengers and stuff like that, you know, but I, it's really none of my business if somebody wants to bring their Hellcat to a car show that has nothing done to it. That's their business. They love their car. That's awesome. Um, I have noticed a, a, a weird correlation between the import scene because when I was in high school, it was right when Fast and the Furious came out. I think I got my license and Fast and the Furious came out <laughs> like less than a year later. So the import scene has definitely, or the tuner scene, whatever you want to call it, has definitely influenced these modern Mopars. Like I go to these shows and I see some that are completely stock with just a bunch of blinking lights. And I'm like, wow, they're showing these cars. It reminds me a lot of the tuner scene back in the day. Um, and it still exists now. I've gone to a car, except for one thing I've noticed about these tuner cars lately is everything has gotten to the extreme. You know, you see their wheels and tires that are cambered out so much. That it's like, how can that even be safe to drive? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's insane. Um, but I, I'm a fan of cars and I'm a fan of the ability to take a car and create something that is individualized to you you know, something that you like. So it's a lot of cars that I see aren't my particular style, but I appreciate that somebody took the time, even though I don't agree with their build. I appreciate that they love their car so much that they invest the time and money into building it. That's cool. But anyways, enough of that. My buddy, Paul. Yep. My first job was at Baskin Robbins and bought my first Roadrunner at 17. Loved it, man. You're lucky. I would have how many scoops <laughs> you know what i mean i would have scooped all night long <laughs> for a roadrunner at 17 um another thing was that it was really hard to find mobile at the time i was looking for cars to drive there really wasn't much for mopars that were even close to something that i could afford you know and the ones that were affordable were complete basket cases and at the time that we didn't have facebook marketplace or craigslist um you know the best thing that we had around here was like the little nickel one ads or like auto trader and i didn't even know when i was young i didn't even know mopar collector's guide existed my dad really didn't take me to muscle car shows that often i went to like the international auto show and there was a couple like there was a show um for those of you that are from the northwest uh at the coliseum that was like all muscle cars and stuff like that but i was too young to understand so the resources for me if i would have gotten something that cool uh, paul if i would have gotten a roadrunner at 17 it would have had to have been running and driving because i don't know where i would have found parts for it um maybe i would have gotten lucky and met some people just driving it around you know that's probably what happens a lot but around here it seemed like the mopars were really dried up i there was a period of time where I never saw Mopars just sitting on the side of the road, maybe a couple here and there. Maybe there was a handful in the entire, I would say in a 30 mile radius, I only knew of a handful. One of them was a 69 Dodge Charger Daytona. Um, but uh, I don't even know if I've talked about that car um, probably early on in the podcast, but <clears throat> it was one of the cars that inspired me to start the Mopar Hunter Facebook page. So if I could ever find that car, I would love to have it. <laughs> Roy says my first car was a Honda Accord Brown. It caught on fire. <laughs> yeah, I learned how to drive a stick shift in my dad's '79 Honda Accord. That was fun. I learned how to do. A, I learned how to drop a clutch and <laughs> do a front wheel drive burnout. It was ridiculous. Billy says it's all taken apart, but it was a complete car. The original motor is missing. It was blown up, but he has a date coded correct block, and the four speed is there as well. The body was soda blasted and epoxied. It has eight and three quarter rear Posi 355 gear. Um, 5500 for uh billy's talking about a big block barracuda 69 um project car that is for 5500 dollars. it sounds like it's solid needs some needs some work but gosh big block big block a bodies man they're awesome sean i would have loved a roadrunner at 17 damn yeah <laughs> me too buddy <laughs> mopar <laughs> we know who that is what's up buddy Sean says, I learned to drive stick in my dad's 72 Triumph TR6. Those cars are so, so cool. Um, they're small, man. I see them every once in a while. Gosh, they, uh, I wouldn't want to get in an accident in one of those. 
back in the day, I had a, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I've ever talked about this. Uh, back in the day, I had a, I had a few of them just because they were all I could afford. And I thought they were kind of cool. Um, I had a Honda CRXs, the little two seaters, and I got in a car accident with one, man, there's a car that I would suggest not getting in a car accident and it's a little CRX because they are death traps. Um, thankfully, my buddy and I got out virtually unscathed. Paul says, I got lucky. My dad is a huge Mopar guy. Taught me young and we sought out an A-body and found the Roadrunner. That's awesome. My dad tried to talk me back into the A-body tarp, but I was hooked on the Roadrunner. I don't blame you, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, that's... Uh, that's... <laughs> Gosh, I, I just had a little, like a daydream of what it would be like to have a Roadrunner at 17. I would have gotten in so much trouble with that car because I attended the street races and around here it was all import stuff. And every once in a while, you'd get a guy with a V8 that came through. I remember a guy had a Ford Lightning, you know, big deal. But I mean, if you're racing a bunch of Hondas and stuff, you're going to smoke them. Um, a couple Fox Body Mustangs. Uh, I think there was a Cobra that rolled through one night and just <laughs> blew everybody's doors off. Um, but man, if I had a Roadrunner back then, man, <laughs> I would have gotten in so much trouble because I still would have went to the street races. I just would have been racing a bunch of imports, which would have been fun. Uh, yeah, I never saw a Mopar show up to the street races. That is a tragedy. That is a tragedy. Um, it would have been me had things worked out differently, but they didn't. So... I'm pretty sure, though, that it probably worked out for the better because I would have gotten in a lot of trouble. I got caught street racing a Honda once. <laughs> I've never talked about that because I'm ashamed of it. No. Uh, maybe someday I'll talk a little bit more about, about those days because they were so ridiculous. <laughs> Paul said his dad said a B-body was too much for a kid. I Yeah, I'm sure my dad would have thought the same thing. My dad said no to A-bodies, dude. <laughs> The Roadrunner had a 440. It was never too much. Yeah. Um, gosh, I don't even know what I would have done with a big block Mopar back then. Crazy stuff, man. Um, let's get into... Uh, so we've done Project Car of the Week. We've done high-performance parts. Uh, let's get into listener stories. I think I have a voice message. Um it might be from Tad. <laughs> I don't know. Let me just see here. So we have one. One voice message. It's 23 seconds long. Let's see what this voice message is. Let's, let's make sure that the volume is up here. Hopefully you guys can hear this. Let's play it. Hi. Um, I just, uh, I just want to say I really love your show. I'm... I don't have any Mopar stories, but I just really love the podcast and the channel and we'll do it every day. I found it yesterday, though. It's pretty great. So thank you. And that's it. Um, that's a nice message. Uh, you don't always have to call and share a story. <laughs> you know, you can call and tell me how much you like the show. I don't mind that at all, and I'll play it on the show. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Um... Uh, I'm glad you love it. That's why I do it because I'm an enthusiast and I love talking to other enthusiasts about cars. It's one of my favorite things to do. It is my favorite thing to do in the world of cars is just talking to people about them because if it wasn't one of my favorite things, then I wouldn't be doing it. You know, um, next to driving them, cruising them, building them, stuff like that, uh, talking about them, you know, with other enthusiasts because if you share a passion about something, you know, like Mopars, anytime I talk to another truly passionate Mopar enthusiast. We always have a good time. I've never talked to a Mopar enthusiast who shared the same passion as me that was a negative conversation, you know, except for the trolls on Facebook, but those don't count. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I kind of... Let me know in the comments. Should I call this person right now, live, <laughs> and see if they want to talk on the phone? I don't know if I... Could I get sued for that? <laughs> I think that would be kind of funny. Um, I don't know if it was a... The voice was really low. I couldn't tell if it was a female or a young man, you know, and I don't want to be offensive. Um, I, I would really like to call them and find out some more information, you know, how they found the show, how, how enthusiastic about Mopars they are, you know, something like that. But uh, maybe we'll try that another time. Um, I don't know if it would be a good idea to call somebody live on a show like that.
Michael says, uh, what's your take on Uncle Tony and Bad Chad? Two of my favorite besides Cash Days. My first with you live. Michael, uh, <laughs> funny story. So let me tell the quick Uncle Tony story. So back when I was running my Facebook page that was formerly known as the Mopar Hunter, um, where I was just sharing cars that I found on Craigslist and stuff, uh, I've always been a fan of podcasts. And I've listened to all, pretty much all the automotive podcasts that I could consume that had anything to do with Mopars. Any episode that had a Mopar involved in it, that's actually how I found out about Blake from DIY Hemi. I was listening to the muscle car place with Rob Kibbe, and he had Blake on, Blake Anderman from DIY Hemi. And uh, shortly after that, I reached out to Blake, um, and our friendship sprouted from there. So uh, I was just looking all over the the podcast networks and stuff, looking for episodes of um, any content relating to Mopars. Mopars, and I realized that there was no podcast specifically dedicated to Mopars. And then um, it was like right around that same time, Uncle Tony really started getting popular, and I found out that he had a podcast. So I was like, oh, this is great. So I started listening to Uncle Tony's podcast, and I was like, well, I guess I don't. And he talked about Mopars a lot. And I was like, well, I guess I don't need to uh, start a podcast. And what's funny is before I started listening to Uncle Tony's podcast was that I had bought the domain name for talking Mopars. I had come, I, I thought, I thought I thought of the name and I had this whole plan as I was going to start the podcast and it was going to be great. And then I stumbled across uncle Tony's podcast. And as I started listening, I was like, well, there, <laughs> there goes that idea. Cause if uncle Tony's doing it, he had a way bigger name than me and he was blowing up. So, you know, not wanting to compete with somebody who would just squash me like a bug and probably nobody would listen to my show. Um, I just listened to his. And then one day he mentioned that he was going to do a show, a podcast with Dave Ray from at the time he was with Graveyard Cars, I believe still. And uh, he was going to call it Talking Mopar or Talking Mopars. And I was like, oh, son of a. I was so mad. I was like, oh. So, you know, that the little pipe dream I had about having the only Mopar podcast was gone. I was like, oh, well, there goes that idea. And, uh, as I was listening to his podcasts, all of a sudden they stopped. And I was like, okay. So I gave it a couple of weeks. No podcast, no podcast. And what I found out through reaching out to Tony was that he was seeing so much success with videos and YouTube specifically that he basically abandoned the podcast because he wasn't making any money from it. And uh, I, I, that message that I sent to him, it was basically the ask for um, his blessing to use the name Talking Mopars because I know he had mentioned a name somewhat like that. I don't know if it was Talking Mopar, Talking Mopars. I don't remember exactly. I know it was so close that I didn't want to use it without talking to him first because I didn't want to. First of all, I didn't want to be a thief. Second of all, it was out of respect. You know, because I respect Uncle Tony and what he's done um, for himself and for his family and, uh, you know, all the entertainment he provides. Uncle Tony's entertaining, whether you like him or not. He's funny. He smokes cigarettes and he burns them all the way down to the butt and he still smokes them <laughs> to the fiberglass filter. He smokes them down. Um, but I reached out to him and I was like, look, I heard on your podcast you were talking about doing a podcast with Dave Ray called Talking Mopar or whatever. I came up with the name Talking Mopars, I bought the domain, and I was going to start a podcast. But if you're using that name, I will either A, abandon the idea altogether, or I'll come up with a different name. And he said, nope, go ahead and use it. He basically, he told me that his, the podcast was dead. He goes, I'm fully focused on YouTube right now, go ahead and take it. So I took it. And that's how Talking Mopars came to be. So I will forever be indebted to Uncle Tony. You know, if that guy came to me for anything, if he's like, Chris, I need to be on your show, or, you know, I, I doubt he'd say that. <laughs> or uh, he needed me to help him with something, I doubt he'd need my help with anything. Um, uh, I would always be there for Uncle Tony um, just because of uh, the opportunity he gave me. Because he could have easily said, I might use that later. So no, <laughs> see you, kid. Get out of here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I wouldn't have blamed him for that, but he let me have it, and I have it now. And Tony, you ain't getting it back. <laughs> um, Bad Chad, that's a, I believe you're talking about Bad Chad Customs. He's an interesting character, man. Some of these guys, you meet people in the car communities that are like um, savants or they're like, that their mind works on a different uh, frequency than other people. And they just come up with these crazy ideas, these in, insane ideas and these insane builds. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, all the, 
crazy hot rodders from back in the 50s, you know, that were building the street rods and the, for the custom culture scene and things like that. These people were thinking on a different on a different level. So Bad Chad is one of those guys. He's created some crazy cars. Nothing. Some of his cars, like I wouldn't be caught dead driving them. Not my style. I absolutely 100% respect the level of fabrication skills that guy has. He's amazing. Um, so I do enjoy uh, that show. I don't watch it that much. I have watched quite a few episodes, but I really, it sounds cliche, but I just don't have the time to watch as many of the car shows as I like. Um, cash Days, I see you mentioned Cash Days. I do like Street Outlaws. I'm not sure if I mentioned this on the podcast, but uh, being from the import scene and seeing the street racing that happened then uh i thought that street outlaws was a joke when i first saw it because i was like these aren't street cars at all <laughs> you know what i mean i was like these are these are drag cars that they trailer to the street you know what i mean nobody's driving this car to work tomorrow <laughs> you know what i mean so i thought it was a joke at first and several seasons had gone by and every time I saw it on TV, I flipped the channel. And I was wrong. Um, those shows are very entertaining, and I love them now. Um, I just had to get past the fact that it probably wouldn't be as entertaining if you had a bunch of 12 and 13 second muscle cars, you know, on TV. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, maybe not for the average viewer. For me, I would have been entertained if it was a. I love when Street Outlaws does the daily driver races. I love that. I love it because it's more realistic for me. Um, and I think a lot of the car enthusiasts that I know would probably relate better to cars that weren't full on race cars that were racing no prep on the streets. Um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, I think they're great shows. And thanks, Michael, for uh, joining me live. First time. Um, I hope you enjoy the show. Hopefully it gets better in time. Um, these are usually like I fly by the seat of my pants on these things. Um, when I'm not doing a live and I'm just in here just recording my podcast, I can hit stop, rewind, edit whenever and however I want. Um, when it's off the cuff and live, sometimes I trip over my words and stuff like that. And I'm sure I've said some wrong things, but, you know, that's all part of the fun. <laughs> my buddy Blake Anderman from DIYHemi.com. Wahoo! In for a random comment. Mopar. Awesome, buddy. <laughs> Big Block is in the house. Mopar or no car? My buddy David Dreyer. What's up, buddy? Michael, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining me tonight on a Monday night. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for joining me. You know, I... <laughs> Every once in a while, I get a wild hair. I had I was so busy over the weekend that I just didn't get a chance to record the podcast, and I have really uh, my consistency has been in the in the tubes, and I apologize. Um, I'm behind on a lot of stuff, and finally, I there was a couple things that were stressing me out, and those things have have calmed down. Um, one was the Mister Norm truck, which um, I suppose we can talk about now. Uh, I don't know how much I. Oh, my buddy, Mike. <laughs> okay, before we get into the story of what happened with Mr. Norm, Mike is actually a big part of the repair of Mr. Norm. So my buddy, Mike News, I've known this guy for 20 years. Hi, Mike. He's one of my best friends. And uh, it was his birthday on the 8th. And <laughs> we had hung out the night before. And he, when I got home, he sent me a an ad for a $200 5.7 Hemi. And I've been sitting on this $100 Hemi forever. And I knew that his birthday was the next day. And I was like, hey, hey you want a Hemi for your birthday? <laughs> you know, because Mike, uh, you're a good buddy. And you're the only person I know that has two talking Mopar stickers on their vehicle. I don't even have that. And you have an old school Mopar Hunter sticker on your truck, too. So you deserve that Hemi. Um, and I, I'm excited. He's going to build that engine with his daughter. Um, and uh, just the fact that you're getting your daughter into cars, especially Mopars, you know what I mean? Um, that's cool for me. And uh, I'm a big fan of Hemis, and uh, I have some connections in that game. So um, it'll be fun to see. Mike is a technician, a Honda technician, and this is his first Hemi build. So it's going to be fun to see what he does with it. I know uh, he's already got it torn down, so that's good. Can't wait to see uh, 
what you do with it, man. Obviously, I'll be watching that very closely. So at the Good Guys Car Show, um, which is a cool car show, for those of you that don't know, you can cruise around the show the show field and stuff and around the, um, the fairgrounds during the show, you know, jump in your car, leave your parking spot, and come back and get your parking spot back. It's an amazing show. On the way home, my buddy Paul that's in the chat, he was with me and uh, had no problems with the Mr. Norm truck at all. No problems. You know, uh, adjusted the idle mixture a little bit, but that was it. We were cruising that thing all day, had a great time. I dropped him off, and uh, on my way home, I don't, I'm not sure I shared this story on the podcast, but I'll try to make it brief if I have. <laughs> on my way home, I'm driving on the freeway, and um, you know I'm cruising 70, 75, something like that, and uh, I start smelling burning plastic. I was like, <laughs> of course, the first thing that goes through my mind is I look ahead of me and I see a couple older cars and I'm like, it's one of those pieces of shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I realize, oh no, no, it's getting worse. It's mine. <laughs> and uh, I was right next to an exit, the exit to my buddy Mike's house. And him being a technician, I knew that, you know, if I was going to pull over anywhere, it sure as hell is better to pull off at his house because I know he's got some tools rather than on the side of I-5. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I had a split second decision because I was like, I think I can make it home. I don't know why the hell I even, I don't even know why that crossed my mind. <laughs> but uh, I quit thinking like an idiot and I got off the freeway, went to his house, <laughs> pulled up in front. He came out because he heard the truck. I popped the hood and I looked at the wiring harness and all the wires that went from the alternator all the way up, the whole engine harness was literally melting, <laughs> like real time melting right there. <laughs> so bad that the insulation had come off nearly all the wires. Um, it was uh, it was crazy. And I was on the street and it's like, fire it back up, pull it into the driveway. And I'm like, shit. And I'm thinking to myself, this thing is going to burn down right here. <laughs> Get it down there, shut her down, realize I need a whole new engine harness. I order a whole new engine har harness on eBay. And uh, I don't think I told this part of the story yet. I got the harness, opened the box, and it's for a 77. I have a 78. Uh, Dodge D D one fifty, uh, and I was like, I don't know if there's a big difference here. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to be a bad or a good thing. I guess we'll find out. So, I laid my old harness, what was left of it, out, and laid the new harness out. And there was only a couple things that were different. Other than that, it looked like it would go in. So, we threw it in there and did a couple little modifications, and the truck fired right up, no problems. I drove it home the other day, no problems. Um, I need to take a little closer look at everything, and I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but uh, I will. And um, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that Mike still lives in the old neighborhood, because that really saved my back. I I would hate to have had that thing towed, because it is low, and I just imagine even if they brought a flatbed, unless they had pieces of wood to pull it up onto before they winch it up the rest of the way, it probably would have ripped the front spoiler off unless they had tools. And I, I didn't have any tools. Um, I also didn't have a fire extinguisher, which I now have in the truck. So <laughs> that problem has been solved. Um, but uh, the other news is that I traded in my 2012 Dodge Ram 1500 with a 4.7. It was uh, blazing saddle pearl, I think is the color. I thought it was a beautiful color, but if the truck hadn't been lifted and didn't have 20s and uh, big tires, it probably would have looked like an old man truck. But I loved the truck. The problem that I always had with it was that it was a 4.7 and not the Hemi. It was, you know, I had like 310 horsepower, but it was still, when you're trying to push a big, heavy truck like that, it's not going anywhere fast. Um, I pulled uh, the Mr. Norm truck home with that truck, and it was struggling. <laughs> it was so pathetic. Um my buddy that was with me on that trip, uh, he's like, are you flooring it? <laughs> and I just looked at him. I was like, shut the, f <laughs> yeah, I'm flooring it, dude. Um, so I, uh, I was still making payments on it. It had over, cause I rolled over. I had a 2001 Dodge Ram 2500 short bed, black extended cab, turbo diesel, 
loved that truck, but it needed, I was broke a few years ago and I didn't have the money that, you know, I don't have, I'm not rich now by any means, but I have more money than I did then. And I didn't have enough money to go through the entire fuel system. So I ended up rolling over and getting, um, another truck, which is the truck I just traded in. So I had negative equity in that thing. And because of the chip shortage and everything else going on, um, it's, a bad time to buy a car unless you're trading something in <laughs> because you can get more for your trade. And in this case, um, I still had a couple grand of neg negative equity, negative, <laughs> uh, negative equity, and uh, I broke even. So that's all I asked. So now I don't ha I didn't roll anything else over. Um, and I got myself a I know that at the beginning of the year, I was looking for a scat pack charger. And I was actually just recently looking for him again. And I had a long discussion with my wife, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and uh, I really did decide. I, I, had to, I had to really think about it. And I, I thought that the Scat Pack Charger probably wasn't the best decision for me just because of where I live. And I don't really have a vehicle that I can drive in the snow or in inclement weather. Um, and I wouldn't really want to drive a Scat Pack Charger around in inclement weather. You know, call me a pussy but <laughs> i just wouldn't want to do it um so uh, i had one requirement with the next vehicle i said it has to be a hemi i can't be doing the talking mopars podcast and go buy a newer mopar and not have it have a hemi <laughs> you know what i mean i did that once and it, i've been miserable for five years so um i decided or we decided that a durango would be a good choice and i've always liked durango's my friend dustin back when i uh was busting tires at 16 his dad had um Gosh, what year would that have been? 2000 or 2001? Um, dark blue uh, Durango RT with the Magnum 360 in it. I loved that thing. I thought it was awesome. It sounded good. Um, and for a while there, in like the 2000s, the Durangos really got shit ugly. <laughs> they were ugly. That's just my opinion, of course. But they were, they, I thought they were ugly looking. And then um, as you got into the uh, 2000, what, 12, 13, 14, 15, I think, is when they started transitioning to the newer style. Um, that's when I started going, oh, okay, good job. Good job, Dodge. And they started making them look a lot cooler. Um, and recently, within the past few years, they started putting the SRT front ends on even like the RTs and uh, even the GTs. So you've got these V6 Durangos running around that look like um, they have the Hellcat hood. <laughs> uh, so I was really a fan of the way they looked. Um, I actually tried to get an SRT. Uh, it was <laughs> so let's get into a little of this. It's we're almost in an hour, but this will be a quick story. So I actually went to the dealership or one of the dealerships that screwed me over the last time I was going for scat packs and I gave them one more chance and I go and look at the pieces of crap they had on their lot which they were I'm not trying to be a jerk they were pieces of crap with 20,000 miles it surprised me um so I go over and I start looking at the new Durangos that they had and they had a um a destroyer gray GT 2021 so it has the new front end on it which I think is cool my buddy Paul who's in the chat has a 2021 tow and go package RT that is badass and that is one of the vehicles when he let me hang out in it and sit in it um it was actually one of the reasons why I got pushed over the edge and thought oh a Durango I could definitely see myself in a Durango because he, he wanted me to go drive it and I, I always get a little uncomfortable driving people's brand new cars <laughs> you know what I mean but uh just in my little neighborhood I just did a little maneuver and I, I gave it a little gas and I was like ooh, ooh, man that Hemi is not uh, you know it's no slouch so um and I'm looking around I'm like this would be a this is great you know, can seat as many people as I need. I can fold the seats down if I have to haul something. And if I really have to haul something crazy like dirt or rocks or something, I'll go rent a U-Haul for 20 bucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I, I realized that a Durango would be a good fit. So I'm at this dealership looking at this V6, right? And the, I hate when dealerships do this. You have the um, the window sticker, right? And this one was like... I don't know, high 40s, low 50s, which is crazy for a V6 if you ask me, but they're nice. They're nice. They're nice SUVs. <laughs> and uh, one of the salesmen, I don't know who it was, was standing there and I was like, wow, you don't have a second sticker on this one, um, which is the dealer markup. Um, I said, oh yeah, it's on the other side. And I was like, of course it is. So I go over there and this GT was $63,000. I about... <laughs> It was almost an underwear changing moment because I was like, you've got to be kidding me right now. 
you're insane. $63,000 for a V6? You're out of your mind. <laughs> um, not when I can go get a... And I understand the new, the new front end looks killer. But, uh, man, that's insane for a V6. Especially when I look at last year's models. And you can get one with really low mileage for like 40, 45 <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so that's the dealership that I went to. I don't know if I told this story. Um, I was at one dealership and I tried to order a wide body scat pack charger, a black one with red, with red guts, with red suede interior. Um, it was going to be like my big surprise. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize that the chip shortage was so bad that I put in the order for the car. All I wanted was to know some time frames, and they couldn't really give me a hardcore time frame, but they wanted a thousand dollar deposit. And the deal was I give them a thousand dollars, they order the car for me, the car gets to the dealership, and I buy it. But because I had the truck to trade in, they were going to lock in the trade in value. And when the car came, we we're going to do the transaction. But I said, what if it gets here and I don't like it? <laughs> and they're like, well, you know, never have we had somebody order a car and not like it. And I'm like, well, would you give me my thousand dollars back? You know, because anything can change in the, you know, 12 weeks or whatever it takes to order a car and get it delivered. Um, so I was like, well, there's another dealership that has a wide body right now, a wide body charger. It's Go Mango sitting on their showroom floor. And it's been there for a while. Um and their sale price on the internet is like $47,000. And that was right in the price range that I was looking at. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go look at that one. But I had or I just put in the order. I just hadn't given them the $1,000. So they were getting ready to hit send. And I was like, call me because I had a couple other financial stipulations. I told them what I needed my monthly payment to be with X amount down, blah, blah, blah. And I said, before you hit send and I give you $1,000, I want to make sure that the numbers are going to work out for me. You know, before I do this, because if the car gets here and I can't afford it, <laughs> you know, then either I lose a thousand dollars, you give me a thousand dollars back and you have to put a car that was ordered by a customer on the lot. So anyways, I go to uh, the dealership that had that GT for sixty three thousand dollars. They didn't have it then, but they had this wide body scat pack. I go in there and it's got a fifty three thousand dollar tag on it. And I was like, OK, that's cool. Online, it says forty seven thousand. And I had a pocket full of cash. Um, to put down on it and uh, I went to the other side of the car and saw the dealer markup it was a $9,995 dealer market uh, markup and I was like you guys suckered me and got me in here I don't see 47,000 anywhere listed on this car and they're like oh you should have read the fine print blah 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 man come on <laughs> you know what I'm saying so th that dealership has turned me off I don't want to say the name <laughs> because they have a wide network of dealerships and I may know somebody that works there. That's beside the point. <laughs> but um, yeah, they've never impressed me. Uh, I've been nothing but uh, reasonable, I think. You know what I mean? Um, they were trying to give me $10,000 for my truck. <laughs> I got a lot more than that. Several thousand dollars more than that just <laughs> on Saturday. Okay, I got a 2018 Dodge Durango RT, so it's got the 5.7 in it. Um, it's got 40-something thousand miles. I paid about <laughs> low 40s, um, which was right where it needed to be. That's every Durango that I was looking at was right in that high 30s, low 40s range. So I liked it, and it just happened to be – it just so happened to be at a lot that two of um, some friends of mine worked at. So – I mean, it was a situation where that morning I just happened to see that they had a vehicle that I was interested in. I went and looked at it. It's a color that I normally wouldn't pick. Um, it's billet silver metallic. And when you're looking at used cars, there's a lot of Durangos out there to choose from. So I was like, you know, I'll, I'll drive a couple and see what I like. And, you know, when we pulled into the lot to see this silver one that my buddies had on their lot, uh, I liked it a lot. It had uh, the graphite wheels or the granite wheels, um, and it just it just looked good to me. Uh, I drove it, loved it. It was pretty clean. You know, it's a used car. I wasn't expecting perfection. Um, I used to detail cars, so it's not that big of a deal if it needs a little touch up here and there. Blah blah blah. No big deal at all. And um, it just was. It's one of those situations where I didn't have to worry about the car deal. And we negotiated a little bit and. Uh, I got what I felt was a fair deal and um, a very nice service contract. So I'll be covered the whole length of the um, loan 
as well as up to 125,000 miles. So it should be okay. It's just going to be a daily driver. Um, I don't plan on doing anything crazy with it while it's under warranty. Um, the only thing I've done to it, uh, aside from enjoy it so far, is the one thing that annoyed me about it was the Dodge logo in the grill. I took that thing off. Um, now the front end looks a lot cleaner. Um, but uh, I, I like the Durango. It's going to be a great family car, and it's not slow. Um, you throw that thing in sport mode, it's pretty fun. And it gets great gas mileage. I mean, my truck was getting 13 or 14 at best. On highway, it was getting 14 miles to the gallon. So, and this thing's got all sorts of technology. I don't know if some of you old school guys are a little against the new Mopars, but if you get in one and you start learning all the technology that's inside them, it's really crazy what they can do. Um, it's actually scary that a lot of people depend on these sensors, like these parking sensors and uh, the backup cameras to do what a human being should be able to do, and that's check their mirrors. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, a fun car, uh, and it's going to allow me to focus on Mr. Norm because if I had gotten a scat pack charger, I know what I would have done. I would have wanted to start modifying it and things like that. And don't get me wrong. A modern charger or challenger is in my future but now i don't have to settle on a scat pack because that's one thing my wife asked me was would you be happy with a scat pack is that what you really want and i was like yeah i'd be happy with one and deep down inside i'm like i would be happy with one but i will always know that there's a hellcat out there <laughs> you know uh something about a hellcat i'd love to have a hellcat someday and this might be my road so we'll see uh what I can do with this podcast, maybe get some sponsors <laughs> and uh, start making some money because the Facebook video stuff is good, but it's not going to get me where I need to be, especially with the podcast. So we're going to keep cracking away at it. Maybe someday I'll get a Hellcat, but I really want to get uh, Gen 3 Hemi in the Mr. Norm truck. That's the goal for the winter. We'll see if that happens. Um, I know a lot of my friends are like, don't put a new school Hemi in it, blah, blah, blah. I get it. Um, but uh, that's what I'm going to do, so get over it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Mr. Norm's going to get a Hemi, and I have a Dodge Durango RT now. Um, let's jump back into these uh, comments here, and then we'll shut this baby down. Um, this month's giveaway for um, the supporters of the podcast. For five ninety nine a month, you can become a supporter, and eventually you'll get extra content. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make it up to you guys, I promise. <laughs> uh but uh, this month's giveaway, I'm just waiting to receive the item that I'm giving away. Um, I don't want to show a picture of it. I actually want to show the actual thing. Um, and then uh, this week, I got to ship out a bunch of stuff because I'm behind on my shipping. Uh, and um, once I get the item that I'm giving away for the giveaway for supporters, uh, I will um, do a video for the giveaway. So that's coming. And then, uh, like I said earlier, I'm going to be at Muscle Cars at the Strip September 10th and 11th at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Um, it's going to be a blast. Racing, swap meet, car show. Vendors are going to be there. And Mopars 5150, they're going to give away some project cars to veterans. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And then the week after that, I'm heading to Kentucky for the second annual Mo Party. Holly's Mo Party once again at uh, Beach Bend Raceway Park, I believe. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun. So my plate is full coming up next month. There's going to be a lot of content coming, guys. I cannot wait. And there will definitely be some exclusive content for my supporters. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But, you know, we're just over an hour. I was only planning to do a half an hour. Let's get back into the comments really quick, and then we'll shut her down. David says, busy, busy at work. Yeah, me too, man. I've been working 55, 60 hours a week. It has been kicking my ass. 318 Steve. What's up, Steve? <laughs> uh, Mopar. For those of you that don't know, I shouldn't sell him out like this, but that's Tad. He's he's uh, the record holder for most uh, messages left on um, the Talking Mopar's voicemail. Um, he says that the license plate for his demon, he's got this awesome demon. I don't know if you can see it. It's GA4, um, which in the Plymouth world is Winchester Gray. Uh, that's what it's most commonly known as. But he's got this demon. It's a 340 car, really cool car. And he's thinking about the license plate, Highway to Hell, HWY, the number two, and then Hell. That would be a killer license plate, dude. 
Um, I'll be surprised if it's not taken already, especially in California. <laughs> but um, definitely, uh, definitely fun. 200 bucks. David says, what? 200 bucks? I'm not sure what you're talking about, dude. <laughs> I'm also, what time is it? It's nine o'clock. That's not too bad. Paul says, awesome show. <laughs> Steve, yeah. Yeah, that sucker caught fire, dude. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, like I said, I dropped Paul off. Paul says, so glad you stopped. That was crazy. Yeah, man. Um, if I hadn't stopped, if I, if I was a bonehead and said, oh, I can make it home, the truck would have been in flames on the side of the road and i didn't have a fire extinguisher i had a bottle of smart water <laughs> that's what i would have had to combat the fire and i didn't have any tools to like disconnect the battery or anything like that so it would have been a nightmare it's fully covered and i would have gotten a lot of money for it but i would have never been able to replace that truck and i would have hated myself how crazy would that have been on the six-year anniversary of me seeing that truck for the first time at the good guy show i take it to the good guy show under my ownership and then i burn it to the ground on the way home Man, I would have, I probably would have quit everything. I would have been in a hole somewhere. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that was nuts. Paul says, dude, you will love the new Dodge. I'm sitting in, I'm like, this thing is old. It's an 18. And it still has, I mean, it still holds up. Because I was looking at some of the 20s, and they really haven't changed. Now, 21, those those headlights you guys got are really cool. I really like them. I like the headlights that I have. They're, they're, it's like two different vehicles. It sucks because I like them both. Um, but, uh, Paul, yours is, I really like the paddles um, for the switches inside. Uh, I think that's a cool, uh, I do like that better than mine. Um, I think the little paddle, um, gosh, one of, uh, switches, I guess, uh, buttons for whatever accessories and stuff. Um, I think those look really cool. <laughs> Yes, sir. Someday I will have a Hellcat. Cameron, a buddy from work, says, you're thinking 98 RT, but you'll love the Hemi. Had mine for over five years and still love hitting the throttle. You know, there's a... I have no issues at all with 5.7 Hemis. They are no slouches. Now, are they as fast as a 6.4 or 6.2 supercharged Hellcat? No. But let's be realistic. I've driven scat packs, okay? They've got a little bit less than 500 horsepower. Uh, it's like 485. Um, less than that to the wheels. And <laughs> they're fast. Now, I know that some people, I know they're not fast. You know, they got Hellcats or, you know, Hellcat red eyes. Um, those things are ungodly. <laughs> you know what I mean? These scat packs, though. I was like, God, if I had something this fast, it's hard for me in the 5.7 not to put my foot in it and leave it in sport mode all the time. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm not saying that the, the, the 5.7 Hemis are fast, but they are sure as hell not slow. I'll tell you that right now. They are not slow. Um, I'm sure if I lined up the Mr. Norm truck and this Durango, the Durango would walk it. <laughs> it would be gone uh, with seven people in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it's just a, it's a comfortable car. I got a power sunroof. <laughs> you know, I haven't had a sunroof in years. Um, nice interior. It's got the black leather with the red stitching and the RT in the seat. Uh, I like that. And I do, I'm not really a silver guy, but I also wasn't a brown guy. And well, I am a brown guy, but I wasn't a brown guy as far as cars go. <laughs> uh until i got my last truck so uh you never know and i every time i look at this durango now i'm like okay i think i made the right color choice because everybody goes black white um octane red which is the color paul's is i love that color that color is awesome but i didn't want to i didn't want to bite paul's style <laughs> you know so uh my buddies had the silver one if it had the regular stock um, like bright finish wheels, I probably would have been a little bit more turned off. The reason why I liked it so much is probably because it had the graphite wheels and not necessarily the black ones. I don't know. It just, it, it looked good on the billet silver metallic. So that's that. Paul says a GT for 63. Yeah. Um, the, his was 64 for the RT. I don't know where you, we'll talk offline, Paul. I'm not sure where you got yours, but you definitely got a deal. Cause I remember you telling me how much you paid for yours. That's why I laughed at the guy when I saw 63,000 for a GT, get the hell out of here. I was just online, um, before I bought mine, looking at a 2018, a 2018, um, billet silver metallic, uh, 
SRT Durango because I was about to pull the trigger and go, you know what, I'm, if I'm going to get one, I might as well get the SRT. It was 20000 more than I spent. And the payment, because I'm not rich, I, I don't got cash like that. The payment was almost $1,000 a month. <laughs> I was like, this is retarded. I, I cannot do that. That is ridiculous. I, I would be stupid for doing that. So I made the decision that I didn't need an SRT Durango and that any crate, that kind of money, that extra money that I would be spending can go right into my van or preferably the Mr. Norm truck. So I think I made a good decision. Yes, it is ridiculous to add how much the new cars are. It's crazy. But sometimes you can get a good deal. You know what I mean? You just have to look in the right place and not go to a, a dealer that has $10,000 markups. It's insane. How you can get away with that, I have no idea. <laughs> Tad says, I don't feel so bad now paying such high prices for classic Mopar parts. No. Paul says, want to race? Um, no. <laughs> uh i don't yeah yeah no <laughs> no i don't want to race ball although i will say this in how much more power does yours have i think they're pretty equivalent and so it's going to be about the whole shot you know do you leave traction control on paul or do you turn it off you know there's a couple uh there's a couple that how how hard do you launch it you know, uh, if one of us pulls whole shot, you know, race is pretty much a done deal. <laughs> but no, I don't want to race you, Paul. <laughs> yeah, Tad's talking about the cars that are like um, super technologically advanced. Um, I don't mind like the backup camera and stuff. That's OK. But uh, like the Teslas and stuff that drive themselves, that is a disaster waiting to happen. I've heard talks about semi trucks that are autonomous that are going to drive themselves. I'm like, oh, right, we'll see how that works out for you. <laughs> Cam says, trust me, I felt the same now that he's ready to mod modify his Ram. Be careful and don't do what I'm going to do. Uh, are you going to supercharge it or something? I've <laughs> I'd be lying if I didn't say that I spent like a good hour or two since I bought that Durango looking at superchargers, but I'm not trying to avoid the warranty. <laughs> Tad, I'll race your demon right now when you're towing it on a trailer and I don't have a trailer that I'm towing. <laughs> That's probably the only way I'll beat that thing after you get the 340 in it. Actually, you got the 340 in it. Is it running yet or what? Um, God, I can't. This demon he's building is going to be... It's going to retain the patina, and it's going to have a nice little small block 340 in it. <laughs> Tad, leave it Mopar. I like that. That's funny. Because then I'll feel funny selling you out every time. Going, hey, don't be fooled. His name's really not Mopar. It's Tad. <laughs> Cam, it definitely is a good peace of mind to have a fire extinguisher. The messed up part is every show that I've taken the truck to, I have a fire extinguisher in the garage. I've pulled it out ever since my, ever since that crappy radio I got from work, <laughs> uh, almost burned my truck to the ground. This is the second time my truck's almost burned to the ground. Uh, I started bringing that fire extinguisher to me, uh, with me to car shows and cruises and stuff. And I take it to good guys and I didn't grab the fire extinguisher. What the hell I was thinking? I don't know. <laughs> Michael says, I keep trying to update my car's warranty and they keep hanging up on me. There's a, uh, company called uproar so u-p-r-o-a-r dot car i think it's dot car but they're a seattle-based company and they do warranties differently so you pay monthly and their coverage is pretty pretty good from what i've seen um you can't lock in for a long period of time i think you have to reevaluate every three years or something but uh for the crazy plan it's like um, i want to say 40 dollars a month which, you know, if you sit down and you work a car deal, the service contracts that they offer, you know, are negotiable. Um, you can spend five grand, you can spend three grand, you can spend 1500, you can work it into the deal. The thing with car dealers is they'll, they'll work the numbers one way or another. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got friends in the car business and I know that they could give me a better deal than I got. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I don't mind paying my friends a little bit more because it puts food in their mouths and I appreciate them making the process easy on me. And I really don't like to negotiate on newer cars. I like to negotiate and low ball the old stuff. <laughs> um, 
but uh, uh, the only time I, I really get my rocks off negotiating uh, with the new stuff is when they're trying to screw screw with me, like when I was buying the Scat Pack chargers or when I was trying. They, they were really screwing with me. And I was like, look, uh, you're going to get me on financing. I have a bunch of cash that I'm going to put down, and you're still trying to screw me? <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> I'm actually glad I didn't get Octane Red because there was one that I was looking at and it had a little bit more body damage that I was willing to accept for a used car. <laughs> and I was like, God, I'm going to roll up and Paul's going to have the newer Octane Red one. Yeah, definitely financially challenged. Thank you, Tad, for that correction. <laughs> uh, Tad has the engine in the Demon um, getting a flywheel and a throw up bearing and then he'll be ready to go slamming gears. <laughs> Cam, can't wait to see your new ride in the parking lot at work. Glad you found something that makes sense with your family and keeps a smile on your face driving it. Yeah, man, I, I love my truck. Don't get me wrong, but it was, um, man, it was like it had a vasectomy or something. It just, it was shooting blanks every time I put it to the floor. It just, it just uh, you know, but it's like that truck really wasn't ever meant to be fast, you know, obviously. But it, if I'm towing a car, I want to feel like, you know, the truck is actually doing some work instead of struggling. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, the Durango is a nice car. Uh, it's definitely the nicest car I've ever owned, you know, as far as new stuff. Um, and it's an 18. So what does that tell you? I'm cheap. I told you guys I'm cheap. <laughs> but uh, I uh, I think this will work out. And my the thing is, my wife really likes it. So she's got a 2015 Grand Cherokee, right? I want to make sure she doesn't hear me. Hopefully she's not watching this right now. She likes the Durango enough where I'm thinking that when her car is paid off, she might just want to take over this crazy cool Durango that I have. And then I can make the move on the Hellcat. But that depends on where the podcast is. And, you know, maybe we get another good contract at work or something. I don't know. But uh, we'll see. Um, I'm just, I like the peace of mind of having a warranty, a service contract, you know, for for several years and you know a hundred thousand miles basically uh that's a peace of mind is nice to have and the deductible is like a hundred bucks so if something goes wrong if i blow the engine in it and it's not at any fault of mine then uh, i get hooked up but i <laughs> balling on a budget i got leather in a sunroof baby <laughs> Um, that's it for this week's show, guys. I know that, uh, when I convert this to a podcast, people are going to get a little bored with listening to the, uh, me respond to the comments, but this is, this is the direction the show's going. Um, the podcast, it's funny because it's kind of going from a podcast to a vodcast, which is a video podcast. I know it's kind of confusing, but, um, I, I enjoy, I enjoy this a little bit more because I enjoy the interaction that I have with you guys. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. All right. Last comment. Paul says, great plan. <laughs> I tried that also. But honey, it's only 12000 more for a Hellcat. <laughs> and on that note, thank you for joining me, folks. For everything you need to know or want to know about the podcast, please visit TalkingMopars.com. And if you have any questions, comments, complaints, Mopar stories, or anything else on your Mopar addicted mind, you can reach me by email, Chris at TalkingMopars.com. Or you can send me a voicemail to my voicemail box at 209-28-MOPAR, and I will play your message on the show. That's it, folks. Um, catch me at Muscle Cars at the Strip, September 10th and 11th in Las Vegas, and at Beach Bend Raceway Park for Holly's second annual Mo Party the weekend after that. I think it's the 17th. Um, it's going to be crazy, folks. But uh, that's it. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. No Mopar left behind. My name is Chris Albrecht, and that was Talking Mopars Live. Thank you for listening to Talking Mopars, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Until next time, remember, no Mopar left behind.